All right. Hi, everyone. Um, good to virtually see you and welcome to our June CSA Ideas Lab about promotion and engagement for farmers. Um, my name is Kate Anstreicher and I will be moderate, moderating today's discussion. Um, so first, just a few tech tips. Um, please remain on mute for the main session. Um, if you have questions, you can feel free to put those in the chat box um, while our speakers are talking. And then we will have a discussion section later in the CSA Ideas Lab in which you can unmute yourself, turn your video on and engage with the speakers directly. And um, the live closed captioning is available for anyone who wishes to use that. And in addition, we are recording this session. You probably got a notification to um, consent to being recorded. Uh, feel free to keep your video turned off if you're more comfortable with that. Um, and we'll be circulating the recording um, after the fact if you need to hop off for some reason or have friends who you think would be interested in seeing it. So how the rundown of the event is going to work is um, first I'm going to give a brief introduction to the CSA Innovation Network. Then I will hand it over to Nina Galley from Local Line and Kendall Ballantyne from Marketing for Farmers who are going to be um, leading the content of this um, event. Then we'll have some facilitated discussion and wrap up. So um, to start, my name is Kate Anstreicher, as I said before, and I'm actually calling from um, Lenape territory in the Hudson Valley of New York. Um, I work at an organization called the Gwynwood Center for Regional Food and Farming, which is based in Cold Spring um, and facilitates um, a smaller organization called the Hudson Valley CSA Coalition, which is a coalition of about 120 farms in our region who all use the CSA economic model. And we have been part of the CSA Innovation Network um, since its founding in 2019. And I'm gonna keep this brief because I'm guessing a lot of you have been to Ideas Labs before or have engaged with content on our website, but the CSA Innovation Network is a collaborative of technical assistance providers, of universities and academics, of CSA farms, and of other nonprofit organizations who all want to elevate um, community supported agriculture in the United States. And we do that via events like this. Um, we also have a lot of resources online that you can access anytime. And we help facilitate um, a lot of promotional opportunities for community supported agriculture, including our annual CSA week, which is a promotional event in February. Um, and yeah, thanks for, for being part of this innovation network by being here today. You can see here the list of organizations that are participants in the CSA Innovation Network. Um, we have a national um, impact and are always looking to, to grow the network. And um, we were lucky enough to actually gather in person uh, in May in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, which is where Fair Share CSA Coalition is headquartered. This gathering was twice postponed because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we had a great time visiting a couple of CSA farms and having a lot of really robust conversations about the future of the innovation network, but also the future of community supported agriculture um, and how it provides resilience in times like this. Um, it's really proven a critical model the past two years um, and so we had a really fun time talking about, um, based on that fact and that realization, um, how we should continue from here. And one more thing before I hand it over to Nina, I just wanted to highlight one particular resource that is in our library. Um, Culinaire is an app that serves both farmers and home cooks who want to make the most of their fresh and local food. And we recently uploaded their guide, which has six steps to build a community around your farm business. Um, it's really short and sweet, um, but useful. And so if you have a couple minutes at the end of your farm day um, to look that over, we think you'll find some helpful tools. Great, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nina Galley from Local Line. Thanks, Kate. Just gonna get set up. Okay. 
Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Nina and I'm the head of content at LocalLine. Um, if you don't already know LocalLine, uh, LocalLine is an operating system for small family farms, food hubs, markets. Um, so we host your online store in addition to also um, tracking important data such as your inventory, your customers, uh, your orders, and your payments. So today, ooh, Today, my presentation is going to be about the best practices for selling online as a farmer. So I'm going to go through four main sections. So the first section I'm going to be talking about is why should you be selling online and how does that fit into your marketing strategy? Then I'm going to talk about the difference between your online store and your website, uh, then looking at how to actually get your customers to your online store. And then finally, I'm going to address how you can use Instagram to sell your products. So why should you be selling online and how does that fit into your market marketing? So first, what is an online store? So the online store is essentially that online place where customers can buy from you. So it's your list of products and your description and your pricing and they can check out. But at LocalLine, we look at your online store as two main components. So you have your front end and your back end. So when we talk about your front end, we mean really that customer facing side of your business. So that, that online store where they can scroll through your products, um, add them to their cart and check out. And by the back end, we mean essentially that organizational side. So this is the non-customer facing side. This is what you as a farmer see. So that tracks all of your inventory, your customer information, your order payment, your pick and pack lists, all of your sales data. It's essentially that organizational hub for your business. So what are the benefits of having an online store? Well, a huge benefit is having access to all of that data and reporting. So you can look at what the most popular products are, what your average order size is, where your customers are, and having that organizational hub of all of your customer information, your inventory, your products, um, all in one place. Also, the, another huge benefit of having your online store is that your customers are able to buy direct from you without having to be in person and without you having to manage all of these different incoming ways that they're bringing orders. So that's your online store. But what's the difference between your online store and your website? Because in order to market your business, it's really important to also have a website. So your website is essentially this landing spot for your business. So whether you, um, so it essentially is what makes you discoverable. So when people type your name into Google, you go to their website. And on your website, you can have your about us, you can have information about your products, you can have uh, different events. If you have a blog, that all lives on your website. But your online store, the sole purpose of your online store is to convert those visitors into customers. So it's a sales tool while your website is more of a marketing tool. So when do you send customers to each? Um, so important thing to think of is what is the goal of your marketing campaign? So if you're trying to push them to learn more about your business, or if you're trying to push them to sign up to an event you're hosting or to join your email newsletter, those are all places where you would send someone to your website. But if the goal of your marketing campaign is to get them to buy from you, then you wanna send them to your online store. So a big rule of thumb is fewer clicks, the better. So how would you integrate now your website, or sorry, your online store into your website? So here's an example from Bluegrass Beef Kentucky. They're a, a grass-fed beef farm out in Kentucky. And um, what they do is they integrated their online store into their website by having that shop beef button that you can see in the top right corner. And they also have it in the, um, in the tab at the top. And then when you scroll down in their website, you learn more about their products, about their business, you can find their shop button um, also. So these are great ways to integrate the two. You use your marketing website to attract customers to learn more, and then you can convert them by sending them to your online store. So now you have an online store. How do I get people there? What marketing tactics do I use to actually push people to start shopping online? So I'm gonna talk about three main marketing strategies. So email marketing, social media, and actually in-person marketing. So I'm gonna start with email marketing. So the best way to convert your customers to go to your online store is to use a call to action in your email marketing campaigns. So that can be your email newsletter that maybe you send on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis. And you talk about your products, about what's happening on the farm. And then you have a little CTA in there to go to your online store. 
um, the important part in your email is to actually add a link to people to your online store. So to really to get them there. Um, also, if you do use local wine, we have a tool called a price list schedule. And that's essentially an automated email that gets sent out to your customers on a weekly, bi-weekly, whatever you decide, and it'll just send them to your online store weekly. So that really converts people to go to your online store and make their purchase. Uh, we actually found, we did a study and we saw that uh, local line users that have the priceless schedule enabled on a weekly basis saw three times more order and, and they saw that those orders were 50% bigger than when they weren't. So email marketing works, but it's about consistency and making sure you're adding that link, that call to action. The next strategy we're going to talk about is social media and social media is a big topic. So I'm going to specifically focus on Instagram and how you can get people from your Instagram page to your online store. So an example here is Steadfast Farm. They're a CSA uh, in, in Arizona, I believe. And so what they do is uh, every week for their CSA box, they take a flat lay photo of everything that's in it. And it's super visually pleasing, as you can see, and they talk about what's in it. So what they could do is they could add a CTA, hey, sign up for our newsletter to uh, make sure you hear about when our CSA shares open again. Or if they also sell retail, add a CSA, check out our online store and you can shop these products. You can also use your Instagram story. So here are a few examples of templates that you could use, um, new product alerts, what's in my store this week, uh, add a discount, and then add that uh, Instagram link sticker to send them to your online store. Um, a very important part is making sure you're keeping that link in bio updated. So whether you use Linktree where it sends you to, um, you have multiple links, one of them being your online store, or just even just adding that online store in the link in bio and always referring to it so that people know that they can go there to shop more. Um, and then finally is you can actually sell through Instagram, but I'll talk about this a bit more later. The last one is in person. So you probably already have your CSA pickup, you're seeing your customers um, weekly. And it's a great place to, to have that conversation. Hey, do you know that we also sell online? Hey, have you checked out our online store? Um, you could also add flyers into your boxes uh, with a QR code that sends them directly to your online store. Or if you're trying to build up your email newsletter list, you can have the QR code that sends them there. I've also seen farmers have big signs with a big QR code on it beside pickup that you can also send them there. Um, and a great resource to actually generate your own QR codes is a program called QR Code Monkey, and it's completely free. Your QR code lasts forever. Um, so that's a great way to get those conversions there. Um, and if you're not into QR codes, you could also just have a sign up sheet um, and just get, you know, first name, last name, email, and then you can manually upload them to your online store and send out an invitation to start shopping. So at Localine, we really care about data. So you wanna make sure that if you're implementing new marketing strategies, that you're also keeping track to see if they're actually working. So for email marketing, I think three important metrics to look at are first your open rate. So that's essentially how many people of your newsletter subscriber list are actually opening that email. Um, so the industry average for agriculture is 20, 23%. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're kind of staying around there. And if you're not, you need to reevaluate, maybe send less emails or maybe work on your, um, your, uh, think of the word, uh, the, uh, the title of your email when you're sending it out. Uh, also look at your click rate. Um, so that's from the people who are eating or who are reading your newsletter, how many of them are actually clicking through to your online store. Um, so the industry average is about 3%. Um, so you want to keep track that you're you're around that number. And then finally is your unsubscribe rate. So are people actually sticking around for your email newsletter? And if they're not, um, maybe you can work on rejigging that content a little bit or your sending schedule um, so that you can keep that number quite low. For social media, a great metric to look at is your average engagement on your posts. So by engagement, we mean likes, comments, shares, um, saves, any of those metrics are you seeing a lot of engagement on your posts or are you not? And if you're not, maybe think about, okay, am I sticking to the Instagram trends right now? So for example, Reels is really popular. Are you, are you playing into that trend or are you not? Uh, your growth rate, are, are, you, are you growing your Instagram channel or your social media channels over time? Are you seeing more followers or not? 
uh, link clicks. So are you actually, so when you add that link store, or sorry, that link sticker in your story, are you seeing people click on that or not? Um, and then finally, some social media management tools, for example, I know Later does this, um, they'll actually tell you kind of the best times to post based on when your followers are most active. Um, so keeping a track of that, am I posting at times where I'm going to see more engagement or not? And then finally, metrics that are really important to look at for your marketing on your online store itself. Um, the first one is number of online orders. Are you actually seeing online orders or are you not? And is that number where you want it to be? Next, looking at the number of repeat versus non-repeat customers you're seeing. So um, it's important that your customers are coming back on a weekly basis to order from you. So are you seeing that more of your customer base are those people that are coming back more often or are you seeing kind of more of these one-off shoppers? And how can you convert those one-off shoppers more to these repeat customers? Um, also looking at when is most active. So when are people actually ordering from you? So if you send out your new email newsletter on Monday morning to get everyone to do their orders, um, are they shopping kind of within the first two hours of that? Or are you seeing that maybe the next day they're doing that? And if that's the case, maybe send out your newsletter more around that active shopping time. And then finally, abandoned cart. Are you seeing people going through the process of ordering and then just leaving their cart? And why is that? So the last topic I'm gonna to talk about is selling through Instagram. So if you didn't already know, you can use Instagram to actually sell products. And so they call this feature Instagram shopping. And it's essentially Instagram's version of hosting an e-commerce or an online store. So Instagram is a great tool, marketing tool in general. So it has over 2 million active monthly users and almost 60% of users actually are on the platform daily. And 44% of those people say that they use Instagram to shop weekly, which is crazy. So you can, um, instead of just using that link in bio, you can actually send people directly to shop from you through this program. So I'm gonna go by step by step how to set this up very top level. Um, but the first step is you actually have to register your business with Facebook. So if you already have a, uh, a business account on Instagram or on Facebook, you can skip this step, you've already done it. Um, but that's the first step to getting access to these uh, tools. Um, okay, so sorry, so step two. So the commerce manager is essentially um, Facebook, Meta, Instagram, their e-commerce tool. Um, so you have to sign up for an account. I, I think there's a few questions you go through an application you go through to get access to this. Um, but again, Facebook has great documentation. So I would really just go through their how-to to set up this part. And once you've set up your commerce manager, you get access to start listing your products. So on Instagram, you have something called your shop, which is the same as your online store. It's essentially just a bunch of products listed. Your customers can scroll through and click on a product to learn more. And when they click on the product, they get sent to a product detail page. So on there, you can upload multiple pictures. You can add product description, pricing, uh, all of that. And then they also have a feature called collections. So collections will allow you to curate different products into um, like a theme. So for example, for this fashion brand, they have essentials, new in, uh, but for your products, you could have new products, you could have um, barbecue essentials or Christmas dinner or whatever it is. You can kind of create these unique collections. So finally, when you start putting up these product detail pages, you're going to connect that product to your e-commerce platform. So you're going to create a product detail page, you're gonna upload your photos, add the price, the uh, product description and the name, and then where that blue button says visit, uh, visit on store, you can uh, link that specific link in your e-commerce platform. So the product listing in your e-commerce platform, you take that link, you pop it in there. And so when people click on um, visit store, it'll send them directly to that product on your e-commerce and then they can check out. Um, be sure to use the specific link to that product and not the generic link to your e-commerce platform because that will just take customers to everything you sell and they'll have to search for the products. You wanna make it as easy for them and to send them there. So some more tips for Instagram shopping success. Um, Instagram also has the ability for you to use product tags when you post something in feed. Um, so you can, uh, when you have a product uh, 
products say it's kale and you take a picture, a flat lay picture of a, your harvest box or your CSA box, you can actually tag that kale in that post and people can shop it. But you could also tag your whole CSA box and then they could shop it. So this is a great way to, people see a beautiful picture, they're like, I wanna buy that and then they can send them right there. Um, you can also get creative with these collections. So you can um, you know, create a theme or a recipe and add all of the products into a collection that people would buy to, um, to create that recipe or, or have that theme. And then finally, if you're doing paid advertising on Instagram or on Facebook, uh, you can also use those product tags in your ads. Um, so there's multiple ways that you can kind of incorporate all of this stuff um, into your current strategy. Finally, um, I actually, we created a guide on how to do all of this step-by-step, -step, more detailed than what I talked to you today. So if you guys want to check that out, um, I think there should be a link uh, below or, um, or the CSA Innovation Network will we'll share that with you. Um, also, if you want to stay up to date with anything around Instagram for business, so more about the commerce manager or any new updates they're doing in terms of Instagram shopping, I would really recommend checking out this Instagram account, Instagram for business. Um, that's the first place where they kind of update that and they share tips. Um, so it's a great place to, uh, to check out. Also, um, together with my, um, with my co-author, Diego Footer, we actually launched a book, like a physical book, which is very exciting, uh, last month. Um, so it's called Ready Farmer One, and it's the farmer's guide to uh, sales and marketing. So we go through uh, a lot on how to sell online, how to set it up, and, and how to start marketing. Um, so if you're interested in more around this topic, I really recommend checking it out. Um, you can find it at ready readyfarmerone.com. And other resources, if you currently use Local Line, be sure to join our Facebook group. Um, it's a great place to be. And any other resources we have, we have templates, guides, everything, you can check them out at site.localline.ca slash resources. Finally, we're also having a webinar on July 12th. Uh, it's all about sales data and how to leverage those reports uh, to uh, make your visit more efficient, increase your profits. Um, so be sure to check that out. Uh, thanks so much for your time. If you have any questions for me about anything, uh, feel free to always uh, email me at uh, ngalley at localline.ca. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Nina. And next, I'm going to hand it over to Kendall Valentine from Marketing for Farmers. There we go. I was on mute. Um, so my name is Kendall and I am a farmer. I am a livestock producer just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And when COVID hit, I did a little bit of a pivot into my business when all of a sudden farmers markets in my area were closing, restaurants were closing, things like that. And I pivoted into offering support for other farmers on how to grow their businesses online. I had always been running an online store in the eight years that I've been doing business. And I was a little bit um, of an oddity at the time, um, having a farmer's, uh, farmer's market type business and a direct to consumer business that also sold meat online. So when, when COVID hit, I really pivoted into offering those supports. So today we're going to chat a little bit about what to post on social media. That's a lot of times what I hear most from farmers when they decide that they want to start going onto social media is just feeling like they really don't have a good grasp on what it is that they actually want to talk about. And aside from that, it's really important that we're looking at what's actually going to convert to paying customers because we are all busy. And I personally know that I don't. So I'm sure you don't either have time to be kind of spinning our wheels on social media and not really getting the traction that we need to convert to actual revenue. So today's topics, we're going to talk about your ideal customer, content buckets, growing your audience, what to post. We're going to talk about the dreaded algorithm that we all hear so much about. And then we're also going to talk about content planning so that we can really get you into a position that when we hit those busy seasons, like we're rolling into, that you are prepared so that you're not falling off the face of the earth and losing that, um, that sales opportunity. So first off, when we're determining what to post on social media, it's really important that we get very clear on who our ideal customer is. 
Certainly everybody eats. I certainly hope everyone's eating vegetables, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to be your ideal customer. So we need to look at various demographics to really figure out who you're targeting with your messaging. It also really helps to not only know where to post, but where to find your ideal customers if you're looking to grow. And a lot of times for farmers, I know I felt the same way when I was starting off. I felt a little intimidated or a little uncomfortable talking direct into the camera on my phone in Instagram stories. I would be the one at the farmer's market kind of at the back of the building with my phone low talking to people, a little uncomfortable talking into my phone. But once I realized who my ideal customer was, it was easier for me to narrow down and say I was talking to this person, which became a lot less intimidating for me when I really knew who I was talking to and what would resonate for them. So when we're looking at your ideal customer, we're going to look at things like your, their age, location, family composition, hobbies and interests. We also need to look at things like income level, education level, perhaps, and other brands they align with. So when we go into, for example, a CSA, what you may be selling, it's easy to say that we sell to everyone, but when we start to actually break it down, typically we'll be able to find some of these demographics that we're more successful with. For example, you're probably selling to an older customer base. Because you're doing a CSA and people need to be comfortable being able to cook a wide variety of different vegetables, you're not typically in most areas going to find that with a really low age bracket. So that might be the people that are more prone to like getting the vegetables that they're comfortable with versus being able to have the culinary experience to be able to jump in anywhere. We also need to look at things like location. You're gonna be hyper-local, like chances are you're selling to a very hyper-local community. We can look at things like family composition. If you are selling a large CSA box, you are perhaps looking for a multiple person family versus a single person. Hobbies and things come into play if someone likes travel. They're probably not gonna be the best fit for you if they are traveling and camping and not at home through your CSA season. We also look at things like income level because chances are you're selling a more expensive product. And with a CSA, people are buying up front and that doesn't fit into everyone's budget. And also things like if you are doing farm gate pickup for your CSA and you are in a rural area, chances are that you don't have transit or good transit into your area. So that would require your ideal customer having a way to get to your farm to pick up, which is usually means that they have to be able to afford a vehicle. So we can look at those different things. And then it comes down to what other brands do they align with? And the reason I say that is, if we are trying to grow on social media, it's important to figure out, this is my ideal customer, now what? And when we take a look at what other brands they align with, it makes it a little bit easier. And the reason it makes it easier is it gives us an opportunity to take a look at where else on social media does our ideal customer hang out. So you sell organic vegetables. Chances are your customers, there's gonna be a bunch of women in your customer base. Again, this is demographic, so it's a little bit making a stereotype, but chances are they care about what they put inside their body. Does that mean that they also shop at the farmer's markets? Maybe they're hanging out on the social media page of the farmer's market. Does it mean that they might also be going to a Pilates or a yoga class? Chances are, if they care about their body, they're interested in running, they're interested in different activities like that. And when we're looking to grow our audience, it's important that we're going out and actually physically engaging on social media with where our ideal customer is hanging out. So that might be following your local Pilates studio and engaging. It might mean that maybe you sell a CSA as well as attend farmer's markets. Maybe that means you're going to go into your local farmer's market. In my area, Vancouver farmer's market is a really big market that, that I sold at for many years. If I'm wanting to grow my audience on social media, I would go over to the farmer's market and I would see who's tagging the farmer's market in photos because chances are if they're not a vendor it means that they're a shopper of that farmer's market because people aren't really hanging out on other farmer's market pages for the most part so if they're tagging people it means that you already know that they like supporting local farmers they're in that local area that you're looking for and it helps you be able to really go out and engage and find those people so that they can learn about your farm now how do you engage in them 
please don't comment, follow me. <laughs> it's a matter of, for example, if you go over and you see somebody is tagging the farmer's market in your community in a post, it's going over and commenting on that photo and saying something like, hey, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to support local farms. We cannot do this without you. And having an opportunity to have customers like you is so valuable to the farms in our community. Something along those lines. And if you think about it, if you're a person that receives a nice message like that, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, oh, who's that? And then they click over to your account and if you've got an awesome bio, uh, if you've got an awesome bio that hooks them in, they're really able to make a decision like, hey, this is another local farm that maybe I can support. So it's a matter of making sure that we go out and engage with people. You also want to make sure that you're including your social media links in everything that you do. It needs to be in your CSA boxes that go out. It needs to be in all these different places, in your email signature, on your website, so that people are constantly getting called to go over to your social media and engage and join you over there. It's important too that you put thought into what you're posting. So once you know what your ideal customer is, you can start looking at things like what your content buckets are. So sometimes you're, you'll hear it called content pillars or topics or themes. I'm a farmer, so I call it buckets. Um, but content buckets are those kind of overarching themes that you're going to use when you're coming up with what you post. Once you know who your ideal customer is, it's easier to come up with what those content pillars are. I'm a meat producer outside of Vancouver. My content pillars, one of them is always going to be me. And it needs to be you. You need to show up in your marketing efforts. So as much as that might be a little cringy, if you feel uncomfortable on social media, it's really important that you're showing up yourself as well. One is going to be my products. I can't sell my products unless I talk about them. One for me is showing our ranch and our ranching community. One's showing family. One's showing animals that are on the farm. And then I have one that is kind of quotes and memes and that kind of thing. I make them on brand for our business, but we get a lot of engagement through those. So as much as it's not necessarily a typical thing for everyone's account, it's something that really has grown our account well. So I make sure that I include that content bucket. The nice thing about having those content buckets is when I get stumped on what to post, I can easily look on my social media and say, hey, I haven't posted blank in a while. That's a good one to put in the mix because ideally in your feed, and I'm talking specifically about Instagram, it's nice to get a good mix of things so that when people go on, when they are following you or deciding if they're going to follow you for the first time, it's really important that they get kind of like that snapshot about what your account is about very quickly. So if you have a nice blend in that first, say, nine photos on your feed, because that's really kind of what people are seeing when they first come over, it gives them a really good idea very quickly to determine whether or not your account is a fit and an interest to them. So it's important that all of your posts have purpose. We cannot sell in every single post that we do. There is a famous marketer, Gary V, and he talks about hook, hook, or uh, jab, 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 right hook. And the key there is you want to be giving people content that entertains, that builds relationship, that creates brand awareness, that be, creates content of value for your customer. And then you want to hit them with a sales post. You want that nice blend because people ideally are not really on social media to be sold to all the time. They don't, it's like when you go to a store and they have a commission salesperson and they're like always kind of lurking by the sides of the aisles, poking, popping their head up. You don't want to be that person. You want to be selling. It's the reason that you're on social media. We don't have time to not sell, but you want to make sure that you're creating that in other engaging content as well. When it comes to social media, you really want to develop no like and trust factor. That's really important. We cannot compete with the marketing budgets of huge Costco's of the world, all of those big organizations. But the thing that we have that they don't is we are the people behind the brand. And it is a lot easier for us to develop no like and trust factor. And it's also really important as those big brands create those greenwashing and all of those terms that they use on everything in the big box retailers. Customers are wanting to get that connection with their farmers, and this is a really great way. Social media, email marketing, those are really great ways to develop that know, like, and trust factor because as we try to get people down the funnel from just brand awareness, they hear about us for the first time, down to actually paying for our product, 
that creating that know, like, and trust factor is what gets them to convert. It's that relationship building. So it's really important when we're creating content that we keep that in the back of our mind as we go through the process. When it comes to producing content on social media, unfortunately, we are at the mercy of the algorithm. It didn't used to be like that. It used to be, you know, first come, first serve with doing your posts. But the way that social media has developed, it's really dependent on how the algorithm favors content. So I know Nina mentioned like Instagram's really pushing for reels right now. So it's a good time to lean into video content, short form video content. We need to understand how that algorithm works so that we can make sure we're producing content that's going to fit. So when you put content out, I'm going to use Instagram for this example, but the same applies for Facebook. When you put a piece of content out, they let that content go out to a small number of your followers. Once that content goes out to the number of your followers, how those followers interact with that content determines the success or popularity or importance. I use that because that's their algorithm deciding that. That doesn't mean that if you have a post that doesn't do well, that it was no good. It just means that people haven't interacted with it well enough to push it out because as the engagement increases, it pushes out to more and more people. And that's when you start getting viral. You go viral with your posts. It means that at the beginning, people were interacting with it. And as more and more people engage and interact with it, it snowballs. So our key is we really want to be creating content that people find value in so that they engage. So how do you encourage engagement and interaction? So I know Nina mentioned calls to action. We use calls to action, not just in our email newsletter to get people to go onto our online store. We want to encourage engagement on our specific posts inside of social media as well. This is very important. If you are multitasking, and I know you're a farmer, if you're multitasking, come back to me. Very important. If you sell a seasonal product like most vegetable producers do, you cannot fall off the face of the earth in the off season and then jump back in when it's time to launch your CSA sales and expect that the algorithm is going to work in your favor. You need to keep that warmed up. So the key is to do posts that in encourage engagement and they have calls to action and not every call to action should be go to my online store shop now order now come to the farmer's market sometimes we need those like soft interactions those easy yeses for people where it doesn't feel like they're making a big leap and actually giving us our money so silly little post example but uh, i ranch on an off-grid property so i did a little you know hey this must be might be silly but i really want to get a proper clothesline on my farm it doesn't really fit with the fact that i'm a meat producer but my followers know that my off-grid ranch is really part and parcel with my branded entity and it's something that i talk about so I put that out there, like, am I the only one? That was my engagement. That was my call to action is, am I the only one who wants like a proper pretty clothesline in my backyard? And if you look, people shared it, people interacted with it, people commented on it. It was an easy engagement ask. Now, the beautiful thing with that is, as I'm warming up the algorithm in my favor, Leading up to launching a CSA, you can bet I would be asking for those simple engagements and those simple call to actions in the lead up to launching because I want Instagram and Facebook to say Central Park Farms is producing content that people like that they want to engage with. So we're going to show their content to more people because sales posts typically don't get the best engagement they're usually not really strong on engagement so it's good to warm them up like you got a bumper crop of zucchinis. Give me your favorite zucchini recipe because I am up to my eyes in zucchini. People love to share their opinion. They love to share that kind of stuff. They're going to go on there and they're going to tell you their favorite zucchini recipe. You're warming up that algorithm. Then you're launching something for sale. So those are some quick examples of some easy calls to action. Of course, some of them do need to be head to the link in my bio to visit my online store to order, but they don't all need to be that. When we are starting out in social media or when we are coming up with a plan or making changes to our social media and how we do things, it is really important that we take time to hang out in our analytics and our insights because, again, we don't want to spin our wheels and be creating content that's not working. So if you go inside of your social media insights and take a look at the types of posts that are resonating best with your customers, like I said earlier, those ones that are like memes and quotes, they do really well for me. 
Also, the ones where my family shows up in the photos do really well for me. Sales posts typically are not going to do great, but please don't cut those ones. You have to sell your product. But once you start getting a good idea of what resonates, it makes it easier for you to find those content buckets and, and lean into those types of content. It also helps you so that you're like, hey, I'm going to launch my CSA subscription this week. I should probably do for a few weeks leading up to it, some of those ones that I know always resonate really well with my ideal customer and really get some of those po posts going out. So it's important that you are going in there and hanging out in your insights. So when we are in a busy season, we need to make sure that we are planning ahead for what it is that we're gonna post. Because again, when we're trying to keep that algorithm going in our favor, if we fall off the face of the earth in busy season, we're losing a really great opportunity. When we are head down in the field and not paying attention to the day of the week it is, it becomes really easy for us to miss a sales opportunity coming up. We want to make sure that we're planning. And the way that I do that is I sit down once a month. If that feels like too much, I would at least sit down once a season. I'm old school, I like a paper calendar. I sit down and I mark down any of the important dates. Launching your CSA for sale, your CSA estimated start date, all of those things. It can be holidays that you sell products for. If you have specific start of a farmer's market season, whatever it is, then the key is you need to work backwards from that on your calendar. So for example, I'm a meat producer. Football, <laughs> Super Bowl, I sell chicken wings. Like, give me a break if I miss Super Bowl. That's a huge marketing miss for me. And if I'm not paying attention because I don't have a lot of time to watch Sunday football, then I miss that date when it comes up. So it's important for me to put on my calendar, football's on Sunday. Now I can't start talking about chicken wings on Saturday because my chicken wings are frozen and they're at my farm and that doesn't give people enough time to get their hands on my product. So I need to work it back. I do home delivery. I have a deadline for my home delivery. If I want chicken wings thawed for people to cook on Sunday, my last delivery day of the week is Friday. If I've got a 48 hour um, you know, thing, you got to order 48 hours in advance. That means I need to be making sure that people are ordering by Wednesday at the latest. Work it back. That way I know I need to start talking about my famous chicken wing recipe that I share every year because it's great evergreen content for that season. I need to be talking about it sooner than that. Because if I wait till Saturday, they can't get my product. And all I did was convince people to go buy somebody else's chicken wings from the big box retailer and make those chicken wings. I'm missing the point then. So it's important that we back, go back into our calendars and really figure out those key important sales opportunities so that we aren't missing them. When we are in our busy season, it's also really beneficial to actually batch some of our content out. So I talked briefly about creating that evergreen content. So like that chicken wing recipe that goes out every single year at Super Bowl. I also have, you know, for example, I've got a blog post about how to make easy midweek meals for busy families. That goes out every year when kids go back to school because my ideal customer is a mom and she is overwhelmed when her kids are going back to school. I have kids, I know that overwhelm well. So I use that content every single September. I'm Canadian, our kids go back to school in September. When they go back to school, that is going out in my newsletter, on my social, I'm revamping it. And of course, the recipes and products include my product. So it is a sales post that is creating value and I'm sending it out evergreen. So those are things that I can batch. I could post that blog post already preloaded until the end of time because I know kids go back to school at the same time every year and that content is still going to be of value next year like it was this year. So creating some of those content options and batching them in, in advance, they don't all have to be time sensitive. Of course, when you're harvesting tomatoes for the first part of the season, that's time sensitive. You're announcing that tomatoes are finally in season. Of course, we know approximately when, but when you're actually harvesting them, depending on the weather, that's going to be something time sensitive. Why you started farming, an introduction to you as a farmer, what markets you attend, a recipe, educational posts about farming, 
those can happen anytime. Like those can happen. You can plan that in advance. So when you're in your off season in the winter, and if you do have an off season, if you're in your off season, that's a really great time to say, Hey, I know I'm going to be slammed in the spring. I know I'm going to be slammed in August. Here's where I'm going to start writing down and creating that content and batching it so that when I'm busy, I have one less thing on my plate. So when we do batching content, you can do, there's options. You can save it as a draft in Instagram or Facebook. You can schedule it in Facebook page manager. You can use an app like Planoly or similar. Word of caution. <laughs> you will lose your drafts if you save them in drafts. If you do things like me, like run your phone over with a tractor and have to buy a new phone, you're toast. So I do recommend a program like Planoly. It's free if you use it on the small scale or even just add it as a notes. I put them as notes. So I have an album in my phone that I create content into. I actually have a few al albums in my phone. I take photos of the type of content. So I've got one that says I'm, I'm a meat producer. So I have like pigs, cattle, farmer's markets, ranch, all those different content buckets that I talk about. And then when I go out on the farm, I'm not taking one photo. We need to save time. I'm not taking one photo. I'm taking one like this. I'm taking one like this for my newsletter. I'm taking a, uh, one above, one below, all the different angles, and I'm saving them in that album. And the reason is then next year, if I get into a busy season and I don't have time, a tomato is a tomato, whether it's this year's tomato or next year's tomato, as long as you're growing the same variety, like you can use the photos that you created in past years. If you're marketing your CSA and you've saved photos of, a, you know, top lay of a CSA of your weekly CSA from last year, that's an incredible asset to be able to use for your marketing this year. So I use albums to save it in. And then I write out some captions in my notes that way, no matter what happens to my phone. And I just find it a little bit easier to do it that way than use a fancy app. I, they're great. I just, I, notes works for me and it's free. So I do it that way. And then when I'm stumped or I, you know, I'm too busy, throw a photo in that you have in that file and throw a caption on it and you're done because we have to still be able to post. Otherwise, when we do have something to sell, if we're just kind of popping out of the bushes and not having you know, supported those relationships for months, it doesn't get any traction. So it's really important that we're doing that. I have some extra resources because this is, we have a condensed amount of time to get to talk to you. I have an hour long workshop that is available for you. Um, that website is live now. It comes with a workbook and it is five ways to really build relationships online. Our business has grown exponentially because of social media. Social media is the number one driver and email marketing using social media to funnel people to our new email newsletter. But online free content creation is the number one driver of business for our farm. It has meant massive increases in our growth. We now sit at capacity for what our production is and have for a couple of years now. I really, really relationship building online is is the key to our success as a business so we do um, one on uh, for an hour that gives you some tips that are easy tangible from a farmer to a farmer so if you want to check that out you can check out that website otherwise you can stay in touch with me I do have um, a website as well as an Instagram page specifically with free marketing tips for farmers it is just scrappy not selling you anything you can just go on there and check that out Great, thank you so much, Kendall. And thank you again, Nina. Um, so now we do have time. We have about 10 minutes um, before this call is going to wrap up. And so if people have questions, feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself and you can just ask it directly or you can um, put stuff in the chat box. Okay, it looks like we have some shy people. So um, one thing that I wanted to ask is if you were only going to do one thing to promote yourself better online, what would it be? I will go first. The thing, I mean, it's really hard to narrow it down to one thing, but the thing I regret most in marketing my business, as much as I want to teach what you should do, I also want to teach what I did wrong. I didn't launch email marketing fast enough. I had it in my head that I was too small of a business, that it was a time waste, that it, you know, I needed to wait until I had a lot of followers on social media and that I was a bigger brand in order to be able to do that. 
Email marketing is the number one driver of revenue for my business. It is also a safeguard. If you lose your account for whatever reason, if you're hacked, you are building a business on borrowed real estate on social media. I know I just talked all about the benefits of social media, but use social media as a funnel to drive people to areas that you own. You're going to use that to get people over to your local line website for your online store. You're going to use that to get people over to your email list. Email marketing is the number one driver of revenue for our farm. Every week when it goes out, and I mean I mean this humbly, my phone is like ching 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 for my sales app and revenues coming in. Last week I was in the hospital on the on for a couple of days and I missed sending my newsletter. Our revenue was 66% less. Nothing changed except that I didn't send out my email newsletter. Start an email newsletter, please. I promise you, if you take one thing, it's to do that because it will help you no matter where you sell or what marketing um, technique that you have with your farm. Yeah, I definitely agree with Kendall. I think it's really important to build up your email newsletter list because again, that's the best way to funnel people to purchase from you. Um, so I guess in order to build up that email newsletter, it really depends on your business. I mean, social media isn't for everyone. And if you're really uncomfortable doing it, you can build up your email newsletter in person, you know, use those QR codes, use a, a sign up sheet, whatever works for you. Um, but if social media does work for your business, I think like, what Kendall's presentation went through, I mean, it is a great way to build your following. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say. Great, thank you. And I see um, a direct follow-up question in the chat box. Um, Anne asked, how do you collect emails? I'm doing a pop-up this weekend with free samples. Should I insist on an email for a free sample or maybe just passively having a clipboard there? What would you recommend? Yeah, um, I, would, I would definitely recommend having that QR code. I think that's a really quick way for people to just get your website on their phone. And even if they don't fill out your email newsletter right away, like when they go back, it's, that tab is still open. So I think that's a great way. I think also, you know, if you have a flyer with that QR code, like give it to them while you're giving a free sample along with the free sample, and then they have something to take home with them to collect, uh, to, you know, sign up for your newsletter, online store, whatever it is you're, you're asking them to fill out. Um, yeah, other ways, I mean, it, it's always great to have a newsletter sign up on, you know, front and center on your website. So when they land there, go there, uh, link in bio, have a link to sign up as well. Um, yeah. That's what I would recommend. And remember at the cafe when you used to be able to take your business card out and drop it in the fishbowl to win a free sandwich? Do that. Like make the thing that people can put their email address on. They enter to win something free. You draw later on. We used to do it at the farmer's markets. We did a once monthly draw and you got breakfast on me. You got a dozen eggs. You got a pack of bacon and you got a pack of breakfast sausage. It was small. It was easy. The financial ramifications of, you know, the $30 that it was those people are like gold that is currency to you those email addresses they mean revenue to me weekly it was totally good and everybody wanted the breakfast on me i was like i'm buying your brunch throw in your email address and just do the fishbowl style it works really well at markets i love that idea that's awesome great so someone from Oak um, Organic Association of Kentucky asked, um, do you think it helps to have a post series um, and really stick to a schedule like every Monday is a vegetable post, every Friday is a market photo? Um, what is the value or perhaps the detriment of themed posting? Um, it, there is value to it if you can stick with it. So if you can stick with it, and I would suggest always, if you're going to do a series of something, create a hashtag specific to that series and tell people. So if you're like, maybe you're doing a cooking series or tip Tuesdays where you're giving people a vegetable cooking tip every Tuesday, you got to stick with it, which is why those don't work for me because I'm all over the map. Um, and it's pressure that I don't need. But if you were going to do that, make sure that like your call to action is don't forget to check out the hashtag, hashtag CPF text tip Tuesday to get the rest of this series. So you're actually, because no one's going to search for that hashtag on their own because it's one created specific to your brand. So make sure that like you include that in your call to action that people can go and then look at the whole series. Great. Yeah. I, I use those hashtags as well, Kendall. I feel like hashtag farm Friday and hashtag farmer Friday are particularly popular. Like at my nonprofit, we have posts of all different kinds. We're trying to promote events and blog posts and stuff, but with some consistency, we try to do a hashtag from Friday post. Yeah. 
All right. Oh, Corinna, you're asking the good questions, the scary ones. Um, Corinna Bench says, Kendall, help me get over my fear of doing reels, um, hey, which <laughs> I share. How's it going? Um, okay. So yeah, reels can be intimidating. Don't start with dancing reels. Don't start with crazy lip syncing reels like that one. Those ones are intimidating. Don't do the ones where you got to practice them 8 million times. Take B-roll. So what I do is I take what's called B-roll. So if I'm, I'm a meat producer, but if I was a vegetable producer and I was planting a row, I would set my phone up at the end of the row and I would video myself going down the row and planting or harvesting or packing boxes or at market. I would just tip my phone up, get yourself a little tripod and just film like a bunch of that kind of stuff. And then you put them together. You can use um, inside of the Instagram app. I use InShot though. I find it is easier for me. Pay for InShot. It's very inexpensive. You just don't want that InShot little logo on your stuff. You could either do a voiceover or you could add music to it. You could do like a day in the life reel where every hour you take a photo of yourself, what you're doing or a short video of what you're doing. And you could timestamp the top of it. And then you could just say like, my morning started at 4 a.m. I got up and you could kind of talk over it instead at the end with post-production. It's really easy to do inside of Reels. Find content like that so that you're easing yourself into it. Now you're starting to show up, but you're showing up from a distance as you're working. Then you can start dancing and singing and lip syncing and, and really like, you know, get your, find your trend in your Reel, but you never have to do those. You can do B-roll ones. Some of my most successful have been those kind of B-roll or teaching somebody something. You've got an incredible opportunity as producers and, and vegetable farmers. Teach something about how to grow a vegetable, how to prep your garden for spring, anything like that. People love that kind of stuff. Those do best. Whenever I debunk something in farming or teach somebody something, they beat my ones and I do the ones where I like lip sync and they always beat those ones. So try something a little bit easier and less stressful to start. Great, thank you, Kendall. Great, I have one more question and then we're gonna close up. So this is for you, Nina. Nina, based on metrics you see, how much email is too much email outside of the normal wholesale availability and CSA newsletters? I think this really depends on your newsletter list. Like I think the rule of thumb is, oh, sorry, my internet connection is unstable. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. yeah so far so good. Notification. Um, so yeah, so I think it really depends on your, on your subscribers. Um, I think if you're opening your online store weekly, like it is important to have that weekly email. Because if you only have it every other week, then what's going to happen on that week that you're not sending it out, right? Like you want to continuously get people to your online store. Um, but I think a good rule of thumb is, is really check that open rate and that predominantly the open rate and the unsubscribe rate. Like are people unsubscribing? It's probably a sign that you're sending too many emails and they're overwhelmed and they don't want to hear from you anymore. So that's a good indicator. Also that open rate, if, if you're only seeing like the industry average was, I think, about 23%. If you're seeing like 15, 10, like, again, it's probably an indication that you're sending them too much or that you need to rethink your email strategy. Um, but yeah, I, I think I would go for, for weekly if that works for you. Um, if it's too much for you, then, then step back. Uh, if it's too much for your audience, yeah, step back to that bi-weekly. But. I do weekly and we have a 47% open rate on our emails for average. Um, I would say though, if you are a vegetable producer that has an off season, it's going to be real tough to do a weekly email in your off season, but you shouldn't disappear. So if you're a seasonal business, if you can, if, if a weekly email warrants for you, maybe you're going to take it down to a monthly email through the off season. Cause again, all this kind of marketing, if all of a sudden you disappear, people get used to you not popping up in their in email. And then all of a sudden you show up in their inbox at the start of the season to be like, bye bye CSA. And they're like, unsubscribe. So that's when you start having to get scrappy about what you're including. Maybe that's some like how to prep your garden for winter. Maybe that's highlighting other local farms that do have product that's available. Maybe you're highlighting a winter farmer's market. Again, you want to be a hub and a place of value. Maybe you're creating some educational content for kids. If your ideal customer is a mom, whatever it is to get you through the winter with value, not just like spammy emails, but bring that down through your off season and then bring it back up when you've got a lot of stuff to sell. Great, super helpful, both of you. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen again. So 
Um, it is three o'clock where I am. It's at the hour, wherever you are. Um, so we are um, about to close out the event, but thank you so much for being here. Um, the slides are gonna be shared in a follow-up email, as well as the recording, which will be available on the CSA Innovation Network website, as well as our YouTube channel. Um, you should visit Local Line and Marketing for Farmers for more resources. Um, I already followed you on Instagram as well, because I know that um, your Instagram presence is going to be very helpful for many of us. Um, on deck um, for July or early August, we're going to have a CSA Ideas Lab um, focusing on CSA consumer research. So uh, stay tuned for the time and date. It's still to be determined, but we will be promoting that event um, very, on various channels, including social media and our email list. And once again, thanks for attending. Um, it was really nice to have you here. And thanks again to our presenters, Kendall and Nina. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for having me. Take care, everyone.